What does it mean to Quan? What does it mean to Kuhn? What does it mean to Quan? What does it mean to Kuhn? Q U N. Generally means to rise up or stand. Like come, come, kum, kum. Kum here, come here. Kumbaya, right? Let's go. And now we see that kumbaya or kumbawa, right? That kum means to rise or stand. So you're telling, you know, a wa, wa, to rise. Ba, rise in me. Where that ba is the is the tent peg or is the tent or the floor plan, right? The house, the house. Man, hawa rise in our house or hawa cause our house to rise. Kumba wa. To rise up or stand, man. Welcome to Preston John, number 51. Just surfing the wave, y'all. We just surfing the wave, man. Let's keep it rocking. Let's keep it rolling, man. We on a, you know, certified investigation, man. We are in part number 51 of the Preston John investigation. Wow. <laughs> to tie a battle, this is number 50, you know what I mean? So this makes us a nice, solid 50. <laughs> the missing number 27, man. And uh, love to the Templar. He said, well, it makes sense for 27 to be missing because that is the nine and nine is everything and nothing, man. I mean, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, man, 51. Let's get it 51 through 60 like we say we're going to do. Um, you know, especially in this part right here, I'm, I'm going to be going back and forth in the, in the Sefer Ham as well. And then I'm also going to continue that series as well so we can just get it straight up from the Sefer Ham as well. Uh, but it's all connected, you know, it really is all happening. So, you know, yeah, when we say kum or Eliakim, Eli, Eliakum, El Hawakum, it's used in all expected ways from getting up from the prostate position, a kneeling position, or a sitting position. So you're sitting down, it's time to stand, it's time to kum, kum. It may indicate the start of a journey. Kum <laughs> may indicate the start of a journey, a paying attention, a giving testimony, man. So that qualm or that kum, man, it's, it's the testimony, man. It's the journey. This verb is used when items are set up. Idols, Leviticus 26 and 1, or when one assumes an office or position that of a leader. Uh oh. Kum. Kum, kum, kum. Daniel. El Kum. <laughs> yeah, man. You know, those Q's and K's are interchangeable. And he's from what? He's from the, prov the province of Kumis. <laughs> Persian, man. We got to get on this Persian. The etymology of Persian. It's going to be very interesting as well. And remember the uh, scrolls of, uh, Dead, Dead Sea scrolls of Qumram, right? Qumram, same thing. Qum, Qum. We're just talking, we're just talking the Qum, Qumbawa. So we're just saying, What does it mean to coon? To rise up or stand. When we dig on Preston John, we're digging on taking a stand, making a stand, right? We're digging on that Dawi stand. You know, when Dawi takes a stand, you already know, man. Fire out the mouth, smoke out the nose, you dig? Drakan, Kwan, Coon. Interesting, look at the different derivatives, meaning height of people of a tree, right? Kuma, Kama, Q. 
Kwama. So these are all derivatives. Well, you're talking Kum or Kwam, right? Keem. Okay. Different, different names associated. That Eliakim right there is also Eliakum. Eliakum or El Hawakum. Eliakim. Eliakum. From the F, from the word El or God or Hawa, and the verb Kum to set up. God sets up. God rises up, raises up. Usually refers to. Elohim, that Elohim or God, or Hawa, also known as Eloah. The words God and God exclusively refer to the deity, but the Hebrew words. Uh, Kum means to stand or rise up, both literally, literally rising up. Denotes an ability or power to stand. So when you're talking coon, right? We're talking coon. We're talking one who has the power to stand. And you know, Daniel or Achilles, if you remember, is one of the sinless men. <laughs> They put it in the other one. Hold on. Oh, there we go right there. Later rabbinic traditions name him as one of the four sinless men, right? Ancient Israelites who died without sin. And we've been connecting that this Daniel is the son of David. And it's hidden in the book of Daniel. They never mention that Daniel is the son of David. Now, this is the Preston John investigation. Right? We're going to get back in the Lost Tribes and Promised Lands. You know, we're going to get back on that Roger here, Roger Cholas, Pandians, Cho, Pandians and Cholas, you dig, on the uh, Bragantini dynasty in the Kingdom of Georgia. You know what I mean? All the good stuff. All the good stuff is coming. But we've been connecting this with the Dead Sea Scrolls. We've been connecting this with the Qumran or the Qumasi. And this Kiliab is Daniel. We're gonna dig more on this, man. I mean, I'm just I'm just enjoying being back in the flow with y'all, man. By both lips, Kiliab or Daniel was the heir to the throne after the deaths of Amnon and Absalom, man. So when Absalom rose up against David, he was he was killed. But before that, Amnon, they said, was killed by Absalom. Alright. So Daniel, man, was supposed to be heir, man. But this whole thing's happening with this uh, Anon and uh, or Amnon. Again, you take that M off. Now, these are supposed to be the sons of uh, sons of David, right? And we're talking about Anon or Anab and David. And we keep saying this is Amnon, Anon. And he had this beef, right? This whole thing with, about, about this rape of the sister Tamar. You know what I mean? So, you know, it's just, we're on an investigation. We're just asking these questions. Is Amna Ania or Anna? We got to get back on that Ania as well. But in order to get that, we need to get some of these fundamental puzzle pieces. We're going to have to dig on some of their orthodoxy, you know, what really separated these chariots uh, from these Talmudic situations or rabbinic situations, um, you know, these chariots, especially when you're talking about um, when you're talking about uh, Daniel or Kiliab, you know, what I mean, you know, he had a group of chariots that really dealt zero with the oral traditions or rabbinic traditions. You know, what I mean, it was all about Tanakh or Torah, you know, what I mean, 
Anon or the Ananites were pretty much the same, but there were some discrepancies, you know, on how to follow the law, the law between uh, Anon or Anon ben David and Daniel. All right, so all this is happening during the Babylonian captivity. All right, go back and get all the drops so you can understand the chronology that we are, you know, connecting all this to really the 1100s, 1200s, you know, around this, you know, Byzantine up into that. And all this is the same thing happening with Preston John and Genghis Khan. You know, this whole war happening at 1202. So it's all lining up perfectly. It's just different shades, you know what I mean, of the story. So right now we're on this particular shade of the story. Then we'll be on the other shade of the story with this Genghis Khan, Batu Khan, Vatican situation, you know what I mean? So-called Mongu, the great ones. Then we'll be on another shade when we just talk about Ethiopia, you know what I mean, and Abyssinia. Then we'll be on another shade when we talk to Kumse and, and these indigenous, you know, Amari Khans here. So it's all one thing. It's all one shade. Or, you know, it's all one story, just different shades. You know what I mean? And that's how these layers, that's how, your, that's how our history was separated. It was just repainted and, and repackaged and rebranded, thrown, thrown around on the timelines, right? So we're just, you know, shaping things up a little bit, man. We're just surfing the wave now. Remember this right here, that... Kiliev is known as Daluya, alright? That's gonna come in very uh very hot, very, very handy. Also remember that when it came to Daniel or Kiliev, his name literally can be translated perfection of the father. Now, this is in reference to what? Rabbi Isaac said that some question whether Abigail was pregnant with through David or her first husband, Nabal. <laughs> so she was widowed and then David married her, but they didn't know for sure if the baby was Nabal's or David. So what did Hawa do? Hawa arranged that Kiliab would resemble David. Resemble David. So his name Kiliad means perfection of the father, referring to his resemblance with his pops. So when we do get back on the Genghis Khan and we talk Shalomanazar or Nebuchadnezzar and this whole Book of Daniel situation, these are all different shades of the same story again. All right? And you say, well, did Genghis Khan hold King David's boy hostage who resembled him, right? He was not only a righteous man, you know, but he resembled him physically, specifically because, you know what I'm saying, Hawa arranged it, right? Hawa arranged it so that David wouldn't have to question whether that was his boy. He looked just like him, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He resembled him. He's the perfection of his father. His father, David, all right? And that's how, you know, it wasn't just probably physical, spiritual, and everything else. Remember, he's one of the four sinless men, four ancient Israelites who died without sin. And that just means that he had no, you know, obvious transgression of breaking the code. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it wasn't like, you know, he was just... You know, some Buddhist monk, you know, situation. I don't, you know what I mean? I don't know. What <laughs> but it just means that he never broke the code, man. You know what I mean? He just never broke the code. He did. And uh, there were, you know, a few examples of that, like Benjamin, Jesse, David's dad. And Amram, Moses' pops. Now, we've been, you know, throwing out that question, you know, is David Moshe? And the reason why. It becomes, you know, <laughs> it's just so many things start connecting. You know what I'm saying? Like David has a dad who's sinless, Jesse. Moshe has a dad who's sinless. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, both of them, you know, are, are, are slicing and dicing. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, kings of, you know, Moses was king of Kush for 40 years. You know, I mean, they have this king element. They have this priest element. 
And then things like this start popping up. Let's see here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're we going to get on that Kirk Assani. We're going to get on that Kirk Assani in a minute. Okay, okay. I'm actually looking for a different one right now. Let's see. Funny how that name starts popping up. We just looked at right, Elia King. But I'm starting, you know, searching for these uh, David. Well, actually, not David Ben Moses. Type that in. But yeah, that Elia King starts popping up. We just looked at that. Right, God sets up. Right, Hawa rises up, raises up. Interesting, interesting. You know, I'm just surfing the wave. This is what it's all about in our investigation. I was really looking for Daniel. Ben Moses. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. Oh, wait. Let's try this one. All right, so <laughs> this got us, you know, because this is still, look, we're just talking about the same. Come we? Kun, right? Kwan, Kun. Let's go back to the other way. We're just talking about Daniel L. Kun. And if we're, talk if we're talking the same Daniel, right? We're just talking Killian. Who's the who? Son of David. <laughs> Yet, the same Daniel Kuhn is also known as Son of Moses. Same, same, you know, same Daniel. It's very interesting around this Daniel here, man. Very interesting. Especially when you look at it as a marker of the book of Daniel in the Babylonian captivity, which again appears to be you know, zero in right here around that, you know, 12th century, 11th century. You know what I mean? Thir 13th at the latest type of thing. You know what I mean? One of the most prominent carriers. I mean, look, this could all happen in the 1800s as far as we know. <laughs> we don't know nothing, man. One of the most prominent carrier scholars, right? The Carriots. We dug on the Carriots, the Cara Katai, Carolinas, right? South Carolina, Carolinas. Got it. Scholars of the earlier period flourished at the end of the 9th or beginning of the 10th century. So really, what, 900s? So between the 900s and what, the 1100s? Remember that um, parallel timelines in history, man, for, for the wave surfers? Everything, you know, that happened in the, in the ancient times, a lot of it happened after the 900s. What's the schism about? 1054. What's the schism about? 
Now here it says he comes from the province of Kumis. Get this name. But here they spell Kumis with a Q. Just I just want you to see how the Q's and the C's are interchangeable, right? The Quam, right? The Q U N, the Kum. To rise. What's that got to do with Persia? What does rising have to do with Persia? We're going to get on that Persian etymology. You know, this is Presser John 51. Let go. So the Q's, Kum is here. Here's with a C, right? Or a K, Kum is. All right, okay, I'm just showing you. So the Kum is the Kum. The Kum is the Kum. As it is shown by his two surnames, latter of which is found only in Kirkasani. His attitude towards Anand and his violent opposition to the Ananites. So that's when we got on before, you know, get the previous drops, that there was a schism between these particular sections or sects of Karyats. We're going to get a little bit more, you know, more on the Karyat sects and the rise of these particular groups, they say. So Anand's followers are characteristic of his place of Karyism. At first, he esteemed Anan highly. So Daniel esteemed his brother Anan. And I'm surfing away with that because Daniel has a brother not quite named Anan, but here we call it Amnon. Remember the Arnon? <laughs> Anion? So if they would go from Arnon to Anion, would they not go from Amnon to Anna? So we ain't going crazy. We see them going from Arnon, Anion. Now we got Amna. And then you got Amram. <laughs> All right, surf the wave, man. Surf the wave. Okay. Now, the buzzer beater happened right around this period <laughs> when we were talking about who wrote the code and the Sefer Hamid's woe. At the bottom here, it says Daniel wrote several works in Hebrew, all of which, save for a few quotations and fragments, have been lost. There is undeniable evidence that he compiled a legal code, Sefer Hamid's woe, and a work on the rights of inheritance. Now, what it appears is that every king or ruler wrote their own legal code, like that was a part of the code to write their own legal code. So because, you know, we find a bunch of different Sephiroth Hamid's woes, I don't want to jump to, to any conclusion that, that that's a body bag, that these are all the same people. You know what I mean? I know we're surfing the wave quite a bit, but you know, I just want to, you know, remain rooted, you know what I mean? It makes sense at the same time. So, you know, don't just assume because they wrote the same book that it must be, right? Moses Maimon must be a knob in David per se. But don't assume that's not the case. It can be the case. It's just that, you know, it's also very possible that, and we're about to get that set for Hamas well right now, actually, that every ruler or every king had to write their own code, had to write their own Torah, you know what I mean? And that's very interesting to think of it that Think of it that way. Okay, so Daniel also wrote at least a Sefer Hamid's Woe. Well. Let's put it like that, right? So Daniel wrote a Sefer Hamid's Woe. Well. Who else wrote a Sefer Hamid's Woe? Well? <laughs> All right. You got Moses Mamanides, right? My mind. Mamanides. Right. We're just putting all the presters together, right? These are all priest kings. Let's go. You know, in the Preston John investigation, that's what we're searching for. It's not just like, oh, this version of David, and oh, no, Preston John must be this. Nah, man, I mean, all these would be considered cons or hot cons or Presters, except they never called themselves Prester Johns, right? That's not our language, you know what I mean? So, dies the hijack even with the title Preston John, because sometimes hijacks go under that title, like Genghis Khan stole the title. Preston John. So he started going under the title Preston John and King David. He stole both titles. He even stole Khan. That's three titles he stole. <laughs> Damn. Let's go.
You got Moses Mamanides, right? Moses Ben Maimon, also called Rambam. Come on, man. Sounds like, don't that Rambam sound a lot like uh, Amron? You got Amra, right? Moses' is dad, Miriam's dad. And again, <laughs> you got Daniel, son of Moses. And we know Daniel's the son of David. Coincidence? I mean, you know, let's go, let's go, let's go. <laughs> is David Moshe? Is David Moshe? Okay, where we at? Okay, yeah. I'm going to need this. I'm going to need this. Okay. Rambam. Again, sounds like I'm Ron Moses' pops. Now it's also possible. Again, this is Moses' son of Mima, right? And he's called Rambam. So Amram could be Mima. You know what I'm saying? Like that's how you start to you know, make sense out of some of this, you know, what's, where, where are these reflections? Where this do, where's the duplications? You know what I mean? So we're all together right now. Where's the reflection? Where's the duplication? It's Amran Maima. It's Amran Rambam. Rambam Amran. <laughs> Come on, man. Arabic name Abu Imran Musa. I said, uh-oh. So this answer Musa, huh? Huh? Uh-huh. Cause we've been connecting Master Musa with Moshe. But here it is right here in your face, ball. Popping around the time. And maybe a Mansa Musa will be popping off. You know what I mean? Musa. We know that Musa is another name for Moshe. Okay. So did he write the code? Did he write a Sefer Ham as well? Young Moses. Okay. Study under his father, my Ma. So we got to dig on this my Ma, man, and other masters at an early age. Just, just look at the, you know, duplications, man, with this Moshe, you know. I mean, was he in Egypt? <laughs> Was Moshe in Egypt, man? Oh, no. After a few months, they moved again now to Egypt, settling in fun me. So we got a Moses in Egypt story again. Huh? Moses himself was once accused of being a renegade <laughs> Muslim. But he also, but he was able to prove that he was, he had never really adopted the faith of Islam and so was exonerated. So here we got a renegade Moses in Egypt, huh? Now check it, he got a younger brother, David. <laughs> so these Davids and Moshe sure do rock, you know, hand in hand. You know, they got a whole story about it. But, you know, what did he write? Did he write the code, man? Did he write the code? Well, you know, go back and get the drive from the Sefer Hamas. Whoa, you know, Moses, Mamanides wrote a lot of works. And I mean, David wrote a lot of works. You know what I mean? There's a whole list of works, a whole list of works. Daniel... Wrote a lot of works. Here we go. Bearing the name Mr. Torah. The Torah reviewed and written in a lucid Hebrew style. The code. Uh-oh. Did he write the code? Offers a brilliant systemization of all Jewish law and doctrine. He wrote two other works in Jewish law of lesser scope or Hebrew law. Here we go. The Sefer Hamas Woe, Book of Precepts. All right, so we got Daniel wrote the code. I'm trying to keep up. Keep up with me. All right. Daniel compiled the code. All right. The Sefer Hamas Woe. We got Moses. He got himself a code, the Sefer Hamid's Wall. All right. The 
Seems like everyone got a cold popping off. Everybody got a cold popping off. All right, there we go. So we got this cold stuff happening all over the place. And of course, we got, you know, our good old, our good old homie, uh, Anab and David over here, you know, back in the 700s. So you got this code being broken up, you know, different people writing the code. Now, some are just writing the code because they want to write their own code. You know, Anab and David has his own code. Daniel has his own code. They both have written Sepharham as well. That doesn't mean that Anam and David is Daniel. You know what I mean? So, again, I want to steer away from doing that. But here we go with the Sepharham as well again. All right. Later reports that Anon acknowledged the prophetic mission of Jesus and Muhammad and accepted the doctrine of transmigration of souls seems to have lack, lack any factual basis. So, Anam and David, the Kariots, Wong Kong, Presta John, you know what I mean? <laughs> Remember, the Kariots are being led by Wong Kong, and we're just talking the Kariots, right? The Karites, the text of Sefer Hamas Woe, Let Anon was published by A Harkavi. Now, guys, I, we, we got a hard hit right here. I haven't found this yet. I have not found this yet. But remember, we kept saying, because we got this copy here that we've been reading. You can click all these links below. And, you know, all of it's coming basically from Moses Maimonides. Moses Maimonides. But, you know, a lot of this is very, um, you know, they put a lot of Jewish hijack, you know, influence in some of this. So you can kind of tell. But I said, man, I would love to read. Anand Ben David's code because since you know Moses Maimonides he wrote his well when he was 33 he was born 1160 what was it like 11 30 something this is life let's see if it gives a date over here capture 1148 Okay, born March 30th, 1135. He said he wrote the code when he was 33, so 1168 would be when he wrote the code. Interesting that he died in 1204 when it said that Preston John was wrote upon by Genghis Khan in 1202. You know what I mean? Right around that same time, man. So interesting coincidence there. Again, these dates are lining up with the, you know, flow that we've been on the other side of the story. So I'm bringing you on this side. So you got this Mo Moses again in the 1200s. Now you got to go 400 years back, right? 400 years back. If you want to talk. And now I've been David. Places his appearance between 754, 775. That's right around that. Sylvanus told Texas Solomon the builder popping off, man. Huh. <laughs> Forbidden histories of America, huh? So this is another code. <laughs> Same name, you know what I mean? But, you know, it could be something, could be nothing. It could just be something completely different, right? But it's connecting again with this Kirk Asani situation. Just remember this, these titles popping off because we're going to keep, you know, bumping back into these things. So the Anani, the Ananites, right? That this was his section of these Karites, Karites. We connected these Wong Kong, right? Wong Kong, Preston John to the Karites. You know. Wong Kong. Preston John. Sometimes they spell it like this though. Karites. Uh. I'll just go Karakata. Let's 
They also call him Taguru. And they call Genghis Temujin. Taguru, also known as Wong Kong or Ong Kong. Wong Hong, like Hong Kong, was a con of the what? Cariots. <laughs> so now we can start connecting it, right? And then you go click on Cariots. Also, Cariot, Cariot, Kyried. All right, so this is all the same thing as when we talk. The cars, man. All right, Cariism, whatever you want to call it. Cariates, Cariates, same thing. All right, so look at the dates. They gave me right 700s and I've been David popping off here. And then you got the Moses Mamanides, same situation. And then you have to go separately to focus on these Cariates to do what? We're one of the five dominant Mongo. Remember, it means the great one. So five dominant great ones. Tribal confederations or conates. Conates. The confederations are the conates. You see how they're playing with that con word? Flipping it. Now they got pros and cons and convicts, but we're just trying to have a conversation with the conate. A political entity ruled by a con. So if you rule by a con, you're part of a conate. Got it. Got it. During the 12th century. My Naga, 12th century. My Naga, 12th century. Come on, man. It's all happening. It's all happening. Who was born in the 12th century? Moses. It's all happening. Rambam. Rambam is happening. Writing the same Sefer Hamid's well. Man, I'm saying Rambam is writing the same Sefer, man. The Mishnah Torah. Rambam writing the same set, the same book of precept. Check city, high check city. Come on, man. <laughs> Come on, let me highlight, but yeah, yeah. All right. There we go. There we go. All right. Whew. I have to work for that one. So he's writing the same set as our. As our man over here, man, Anand Ben David, right? Related by Kirk Kasani, remember the name. Rocking with the Cariots, but he doesn't start the Cariots, he starts the Ananites, right? The Cariots are the Karkata, it's already popping. It's been happening, it's already happening. Especially when you know that Preston John got the Fountain of Youth. He took six baths by the age of 1165, uh oh, 12th century. <laughs> we're back in the 12th century again. And we're back at another Sefer Hamas Well. Sefer Hamas Well related with Anand Ben David. Sefer Hamas Well related with Moshe Maimon. Sefer Hamas Well related with Daniel. Got it. Got it. And this is Daniel, son of Moses. Al Kum, Misi, Kum, Quam, right? Kirkasani, as I'm saying, remember all these titles. I mean, it's really interesting to read this. To put this puzzle together with you is incredible. It's an incredible thing.
Daniel forbade in the diaspora the eating of those animals that were used for sacrifice, adding to the proofs of his predecessors, others drawn from Hosea. Mm, we're digging on Hosea 3 and 5, right? We're searching for Hawa and David, which means that we got to be digging on Daniel, that we got to be digging on the non ben David. If you're searching for David, aren't you, aren't, aren't you digging on the uh, on David's sons? You know what I'm saying? So we dig it on it with a dragonfly perspective. And when you talk this schism or this riff, between the knob and David and these chariots. Now, think about the book of Daniel, like we said before. You know, Daniel was set up um, by Cyrus, by Nebuchadnezzar, by Belshazzar to be exilarch, right? To be the ruler. You know, I mean, they, they set him up to be ruler over all the Hebrews, man. And really, he was one of the presidents, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, in this Babylonian system. And that went against what his brother Anon was doing, because his Anon was on the outside of that. He he wasn't in that particular that particular captivity. So Anon, which adds that Anon was descended from Davidic line, but as he shows heretical tendencies, he was not named Exilarch. But who was choosing the Exilarchs? The Babylonian kings, right? Cyrus and them, uh, Nebuchadnezzar and them, they was choosing the Exilarchs. But Israel chooses their own exilarch, so that's exactly what happened. Anon was raised up by the tribe, you know, outside of the house of, of Babylon. Daniel, although he definitely had his own, you know what I'm saying, heir to be exilarch, he was being raised up in the house of Nebuchadnezzar at that time, right? He was going through all that, you know, in the uh in the fire. So he was going through his own situation. So there was two exilarchs being raised up, and it created, you know, even more of a schism with Israel. And we're putting this story together in real time. However, Anand's prestige among the chariots increased until he was acknowledged by them as the founder of the chariot sect itself. What chariot sect? The Ananite. Anand's descendants claimed the Vedic lineage. Well, yeah, there's sons of David. At some point, at some time during the 10th century, they had been acknowledged by the Carriots as their leaders and accorded the honor honorific of Nasi, which in the Middle Ages all, always indicated David's lineage. So if you are Nasi, you're a son of David. Individual Carriot scholars often criticized or rejected Anand's view on various matters of law, so that was their internal beef but this is the carrier beef right the somewhat contradictory attitude arise from the recognition that Anand was the first learned and aristocratic figure to lend his prestige to Jewish groups now he was the oldest son I don't know if he was the oldest of the oldest but if we're just talking Amnon or how do you say it? Yeah. <laughs> if we're just talking Amnon, unlike the other of David's elder sons, Amnon, Absalom, and Adonijah, who were important characters in 2 Samuel, Kiliab is only named in the list of David's sons, and no further mention of him is made. No further mention is made of him. So they're not even going to talk about it. Why? Because it lets it lets the entire uh, dragon out of the uh, volcano. You know what I'm saying? If you connect that Nebuchadnezzar or Genghis Khan <laughs> got David's son in captivity, and if you could start zeroing down on when this Babylonian captivity popped off, if you connect Daniel to King David, then now you're connecting when King David was rocking. And now... <laughs> All in now. Again, we're just talking Amna or Anna 
and the Cariots. Now, if you can connect this with the Kara, and if you know the Cariots, the Cariots are connected with the Kara, Katai, the Kane. <laughs> Follow me now. They had converted to the Church of the East, Nestorianism. Well, if you know Nestorian in etymology, it's just referring to an old king renowned for wisdom, a wise old king in the early 11th century, and are one of the possible sources for Prester John. Uh oh. Who is Prester John? Because they were searching for him for so long. I mean, you got the fountain of youth. You are Wang Khan. You're Preston John. You're you're the leader of the Kara Katai. Let's go back. Tagru is also known as Wang Khan, right? Wang means king. Khan means priest. Priest king. Wang Khan. So who's the priest king? Khan of the cut. Khan of the Karyats was the Anda, blood brother of the Mongol chief Yasugi, and served as an important early patron of an ally of Yasugi's son, Temujin. So according to this story, Preston John, or Wang Khan, priest king, is the uncle of Genghis Khan, man. His blood brother, Anda, they were rocking together, dodged the hijack. And then Yasugi's son, Temujin, later known as Genghis Khan. So Wang Kong is his uncle, or some say his caretaker or foster father. Check it out. Wang Kong was the name given to Tagru by the Gertrude Gherkin Jin dynasty. Now, a lot is popping on this Jin dynasty. A lot is popping on this Jin dynasty. That's a whole nother portion of our investigation. Wang means king or prince, my naga. During the 13th century, that's the 1200s, Tagru was one of the several Asian leaders or nagas who was identified with the legend of Prester John, but also King David. See, this David or this John has been reflected in the New Testament as their Johns, Johns the Apostle, Johns uh, was a John the Baptist, his Christian name, okay, may indeed be David. When you connect this to David, my naga, and who the Nestorians are, cause that's why they can't say Christian, they must say Nestorians, Dodge the hijack because they're connected just to the Magi. The Magi. And it goes all the way, man. I mean, you know. <laughs> You're just talking about, you said early, born at 1130, his father, Cyricus Baruch Khan. Leader of the carriers now. I never really looked at this, but this Cyriacus does kind of sound like Cyrus. <laughs> you can go back in the book of Daniel, you know what I'm saying? We're just talking Daniel, we're King Cyrus, you know? You know, was favored. He had favor. Why did King Cyrus of Persia have favor? Any connection with Cyriacus? Baruch Khan? Huh? Oh, come on, man. Tagru had a very difficult youth. The Merkits captured him during his childhood. And he was reduced to slavery. Hmm. Sounds like Daniel, huh? Is it possible that he left the Merkit after being freed by ransom or simply escaped? However, according to the secret history, he was again abducted at the age of 13 by the Tartars. Wasn't Daniel abducted by the Tartars or Genghis Khan or Nebuchadnezzar, who is the Babylonians? Captivity or Persia, who also took his mother? Of 
according to the story, right, Genghis Khan rode up on King David, his uncle, <laughs> and then David was slain. Now, some say it was David's son who was also going by David who was slain. Another David's sons was going by David and not Preston John. All right. So there's, you know, differentiating stories. It wasn't Preston John, but it was David, his son, because his father is also a David. Now you got to look into the David Sauslands, right? Back to the David Sauslands, right? We're just surfing away. Now, Daniel was abducted just like, you know, this situation here. I mean, this is interesting stuff right here, man. When Takru returned to the carriage later, his father was near death. Tagru took his place and commanded the carriage 1165. So Wang Kong was leading the Kara Katai. Let's go back. We got this link before. John the Elder, huh? <laughs> or John the Baptist, huh? Priest King reigning in the Far East beyond Persia and Armenia. So this Persia is going to keep popping up. We're going to get some Persia etymology for the dismount. <coughs> but here we go. Writings of John the Elder in the New Testament. John the Apostle. John, 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 to John, to John, John. Who is Preston John? Because they seem to be duplicating him quite a bit in the New Testament. In the New Testament. We're just talking that Magi. Gotta get back on that Ek Bakhtana. That definitely got some drop. Yellow Dashi. Okay, okay. Or Gurkhan. Korkhan. I'm just trying to get this link here. Okay. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Some more. This King David probably was none other than Genghis Khan. King David of India. So he took the title David after slaying a David. Slaying the dragon. Uh oh. We just talking Kara Kata. Preston John, who was identified with the Negus, the Naga, the Emperor, the Negus, the Naga, the Emperor. African Christian nation. Well, at least they know that he must be melanated, right? Man, this is so much drop when you dig. This is why we got to press it, John number 51. This is why. Because, you know, it just takes you so many, so many levels, so many shades of the same song, same love song. Now down here it says to press a John priest king who was to destroy Islam, right? <laughs> more and more war, right? So he wasn't rocking with Islam. He wasn't rocking with Christianity. They had to label him something different. Nestorian Christians, all right? Among the what? Kara Kittai. Kara Kittai. Kara Kittai is... The tribe of Wong Kong, Preston John. So when you deal with the Karyats, which they keep saying Karyats, 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 all right, and we got the other drop. So we keep seeing this Kirkasani, right? I keep saying. Pay attention to the Kirkus signings. Because again, those Q's and K's are 
interchangeable, remember? And I'll leave some links that we won't have time this time, but we'll definitely hit up. This is one of them. Kirk Kassani, the carrier, and his works on Jewish sex. All right. S-E-C-T. S-E-C-T. The name of this carrier scholar has long been known as Abu Joseph Jacob al Kirk Kassani. But with regard to his work, we now know for the first time, we now for the first time receive reliable and precise information. For this, we are indebted to the scholar who has already done so much towards elucidating obscure points in the domain of older Jewish literature, Abraham Harkavy. Now, this is the same publisher, they say published the Sefer Hamas Woe that Anam and David wrote. And I'm looking for a copy of that joint. Because I want to compare it with the one that we're about to jump back into now, written by Moses Mamanides, right? Because I know I know it has to be major differences. That's why it's so hard to find this other Sefer Hamas Woe. So now it's really like how we got to line up all the Sefer Hamas Woes. You did. We got to line up Daniel's Sefer Hamas Woe with, with uh, Anand Ben David's Sefer Hamas Woe, with Moses Mamanides' Sefer Hamas Woe. And uh, then we'll really know, you know what I mean? But again, we still got to dodge the translations. And, you know, that, that's just a whole nother continuation. Now, who's this Joseph or Jacob Kirkusani? So-called Kirkusani. The ancient Circassia. Hmm. Circassia. Almost sounds like circumcision. Let me, let me get some more. All right. Yeah, this Harkavy, man. So if we could find that Anam and David published by Harkavy, man. Sefer Hamas. Whoa, we in there. We in there. Ah, concerning circumcision. <laughs> I can't make this up. Didn't they just talk about circuit? Let's go back. Derived from the text of Circassani. Kirkassani. Kirkassan. And we said, that it sounded like circumcision. <laughs> and it pops up circumcision and the Sabbath. Why? Hmm. These are all, you know, different books, different suffers, man, connected. You know, the different elements of the law. All right, so you can dig on that more. We're just talking about this Jacob Kirk Kassani. Let's see if I had another link up for him. Pull up this one right here. Now, he's supposed to be like, you know, another great authoritative figure, another great exilarch type figure. Um, and he also mentions, you know, Daniel Kumasi, Kwam, Kwamasi, right? Again, a Karyat scholar. <laughs> All right. So he's Karyat's is really key word. Remember, key word for the car guy. Keyword for the Kara Katai. Kara means black. Remember that. Let's go back.
sometimes it's spelled Katai, C A T A I. The Katai, C A T. So they switch the K's and the Q's and the C's. Oh, man. Sometimes we even come up in our own investigation, man. That's all right. It's all right. Here you go right here with the Katai Kara Katai. Let's see what length this is, man. We may gotta check on this another time. Searches for an imaginary kingdom, huh? That sounds about right, y'all. That sounds about right. <laughs> Everything is mythological when it comes to Preston John. Mmm. Okay, hold up. The victories achieved almost saved the Lao Empire, the Tangu, drawing close to the Katan and joined wars with the Zubu. Hold up, man. This is getting too good. Too real. This is getting too good and too real and too true at the same damn time. Because we just talking... A special place called Tangu. T A N G U T, man. I'm just I'm just surfing the wave with y'all. T A N G U T. T A N G U T. Where are we located, people? Mangi, Mangu. Look up Mangu Khan. Kate, Katai. Katai, Kara Katai. <laughs> Kari, it's the Kara Kate Katai. India, superior. Remember that. Tangu. Swords from the East by Harold Land. The failure of the envoys he had sent to Preston John to return had decided Genghis Khan that war with the Karyats, Kara Katai, Kara means black, Katai is Cathay, black Cathay, Cathay means pure land, a pure land of black people, copper colored people was unavoidable the master of the horde horde is order master of the order once his mind was made up had moved at once toward tangu following the north edge of the sandy desert where his horses would find grazing genghis khan had sent chef noan to the well to find Berta and bring the gypsy girl to him he trusts me said the tiger moodily although i am a carrot so she was rocking with Preston John's people, but she was saying, Genghis, trust her. But it is not fitting that I should command a Tuman in the coming battle between Preston John and Genghis Khan, my naga. We got to get on the swords of the East because they're going right in on the battle and the war between Preston John and Genghis Khan, which we just got. Genghis Khan was his nephew. I do not understand why people have taken up the sword. How did the messengers from the Three Rivers perish? Why did Jamuka, sound like Jamaica, take his stand beside Preston John? Oh, man, we just want to know. We just want to know. Their only recourse was to seek an audience with Preston John of the Christians. Oh, Nestorians. We're talking the Hebrew King David. In the castle of Tangu, my naga. And I'm just saying, <laughs> where's Tangu? T A N G U T. Yeah, man, we got a lot to get on with this Tangu, man. Castle of Tangu, T A N G U T. T A N G U T. We're just talking North America, people. 
The victories achieved almost saved the Lao Empire. The Tangu drawing close to the Katan. Katan is Kateo. Is Cathay, my naga. Is Indian Superior. Is Kalelus. We're talking a pure land. We're talking paradise. I told y'all we're going to talk etymology of Persia for the dismount. Because when you talk Persia, the origin of the name Persia appears to not wholly be agreed on. No one really agrees on what this means. <laughs> but an excellent candidate is the ancient root far, F-A-R, from whence the word Farsi. All right, so they speak Farsi, meaning horsemen. So they say place of horses, place of horses. Place of horses. Here we're just talking about the castle of Tangu. <laughs> yeah, in the time of my father Mingan and his father, no one of our village has seen the face of Prester John. He has lived for 12 times a hundred years. He is a magician, a magi. Remember that uh, story in, ah, um, uh, man, what is that? The, uh, Oh, man. I'll, I'll remember later, man. Oh, yeah, the, the Benjamin of Tadula. When we talked about King David of Persia, right? <laughs> he was this magi, and he went invisible and walked on water and did all this stuff, man. How many King David magicians are we talking about? We're talking about the priest king, the Wong Kong, or the Karakatai, the Karyats, right? Oh, he accepts me even though I'm a Karyat. And they're marching in the castles of Tangu. And over here, we got the situation with the Chinese and the Lao Empire in Tangu. And I have to ask you, my naga, where's China? La China. I mean, it's all right here in our face bone. We got China. We got Katay or Katay or Katai, Kara Katai. <laughs> where's the Carolinas, right? Indy Superior. Then you even got Tangu. And we even got time cool. All right. All right. Yeah. And, and Preston John's at least 1,200 years old right here. Back to the Fountain of Youth drop. Oh, we just talking Persian? We're talking Persian captivity and Daniel and all that, right? So let's get back. So this far route may even be related to the Greek word pari, peri, or pari, meaning around, which comes from the modern Persian Arabic word firdaus, firdaus, F-I-R-D-A-U-S, meaning garden, and ultimately our word paradise, body, bag, land of plenty. So when you talk Persia, it's another vague, you know, uh, abstract, um, ambiguous word, you know, kind of like India or just like India, just like Ethiopia, right? Just like India, because here you have an India superior. You have multiple Ethiopias, depending on where dark skinned people are. All right? And then you also got multiple Persians because you're just talking about promised land or you're just talking about. Paradise, man. Kalelus, which is brings you right back over here. And this is why I think he's popping up, originating right here. India Superior, Karakata, Cathay, China, Managa, China, Tangu. All right. Tangu. And that one's just a body bag. That one's just a body bag. Because he sent 
The failure of the envoys had been sent to Preston John to return. He had decided Genghis Khan at war with the Karyats was unavoidable. So Genghis Khan wasn't claiming the Karyat. Genghis Khan was against the Karyats, right? Come on, man, put it together. Genghis Khan was against the Karyats. The war was unavoidable with Preston John. And the master of the horde, once his mind made up, moved at once towards Tangu. Why? Because there's a castle in Tangu. All the Mongols must be as near to Tangu as we. If you are faithful to Tamujin or Genghis Khan, you should ride to Tangu at once. In the castle of Tangu, so we're talking kingdoms, a kingdom set up right around here. <laughs> There's a castle up here, so there was just multiple spots, man. So Genghis Khan was trying to hit it up. Genghis Khan did hit it up. Now you're talking Vatican or we're talking Batu Khan? Vatican or Batu Khan? Vatican or Batu Khan? And again, when you talk Persians, you know, pull up this link from Real History www.com, man. I mean, Ben, Ben putting that work in for a massive amount of time, man. A hop to the family. And just scroll through there, man, and just, you know, read about it, man. Of course, you got your indigenous flow that they put out there, man. You know what I mean? Paintings of what's already here, you know what I mean? He he takes you to the whole story. I'm, I'm just I'm just giving you all skinny no fat. <laughs> I'll take you to all the skinny no fat. So we're just talking to Persians, all right? We're just talking to Persians. And again, he's taking you through a story, but basically he's showing us pictures of black Persians, all right? So when you talk Persia, you just know that these people are here. Most of Persia looks like these people, not what they show you on the news. All right, we're just, oh, these are Persians. Okay. Well, so is he, right? So is he. <laughs> oh, man. All right, so you got different people claiming different things. But these are young little Persian uh, princesses. Can you dig it? Dancing in southern Iran, you dig? Persian soldiers, you dig? <laughs> oh, man. Persia on the wall, you dig? Copper color Persia, you dig? And they're just lining them up because, you know, a lot of brothers today will easily be considered Persians. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And see how they got the curls, letting you know what kind. What, and then now they got the straight. Curls straight, curls straight, all right? Babylonian, right? So when you're talking Persian, Babylonian captivity, when you're talking Cappadocia or Mazaka or Mosak, Byzantine, Managa, you're talking the Naga. You're talking the Naga. All right, so, you know, you got some drop here. Students meet King Darius. <laughs> And here is accounts of the Persian War. I mean, you know, Persian Persian children in class. You know, <laughs> more and more war, right? More on more war, right? <laughs> All right, man. So, you, you know, we were just taking a dip on what Persia looked like. We're just taking a dip to see what Persia looked like, my noggin. It looks like the same Naga right here in South Central LA. Let's go. We're just talking Persian. This uh, link, maybe we'll pick up on next time for show, for show. I just uh, put this up, man, just digging on the Karyats a little bit more. The Karyats, you know what I mean? You see this title keep popping up. When they talk Kara again, they're just talking black, copper color people. Kara is black, copper color people. This link here is called The Rise of the Kari. The Kari, which is the Kari Katai. 
huh? We got some interesting drop. Sets don't show up or whatever. You need something, just hit me up. Music at 432 the drop. Let's get a few more for the dismount, man. We be coming in hot. So, you know, a lot of folks, you know, is just really trying to put this story together just like us, man. And we see multiple Sefer Hamid's woes. We see Daniel, son of Moses, Daniel, son of David. You know what I mean? All kind of things happening. You know, oh, there we go. There we go. Perfect. History of the car is the protracted struggle between them and rabbinic jewelry. So you got the car is versus rabbinic jewelry. All right. You also got the car is versus Genghis Khan. Right. And then why and the why and wherefore of their becoming castaways of Jewish community is the, is deplorable. Deplorably erroneous, the Jewish historians Yost, Gritz, and others have mistakenly recorded it as a fact that Anand in 672 founded the Karyat sect, and also that the quarrel between him and the Rabbi Rabbinites had its origin in his refusal to recognize the authority of tradition of the oral law as embodied in the Talmud. That's pretty much part of the story, at least, but let's go. Both of these assertions are entirely erroneous. Well, let's go, man. Anon was not the founder of the Kari sect and could not have been because we know that the Karis, because there were Karis before his day, Anon was, however, the founder of the particular faction of the Kari within the Kari group, the faction whose members became his followers and hence were known, were named Ananites. So we said these assertions were entirely erroneous, yet, you know, these Ananites were still Karis, but, you know, okay. This becomes particularly evident to one who has carefully studied the history of the Karyat movement, either from the rabbinic or the Karyat sources. It is but necessary to cite one instance here as proof of my assertion. R. Levi Halevi and his Sefer Hamid's Well, Okay, so we got another. Levi, Levi wrote another, his own Sef Sefer Hamid's Well, That makes sense that Levi... And they put these uh, titles on them, make it they, these are like just surnames, but they're really just titles. Ha Levi, Ha Levi, Ha Levi, <laughs> Levi, Ha Levi, man. We're just talking about Levi, man. So yeah, Levi got his own Sefer Hamid's woe. So they appear to all have their own Sefer Hamid's woes, yet there are some phantom and duplications going down that will help us connect the dots and put the puzzle back together of who's who. All right. So Levi and his rights, and there is in the matter of fast a difference, a difference between Rabbinites and Karyats and others between Karyats and Ananites. As to the origin of the quarrel, it is of the utmost importance to say that the Karyatic Halakha, the real bone of contention between the Karyats and the Rabbinites, is in is its assumed opposition to the rabbinite halakha. Now the halakha is referring to the oral, the oral traditions. Basically, we're going to get some of that. Has so far not been subjected to the thoroughgoing and comprehensive study. All right, so let's go. Halakha. Just tie a few more things in, man. Impress the John fifty. Let's go fifty one, huh? Man, I'm trying to keep up myself. 51, man. We go on press of John 60 for the real one. Neighborhood knit right here, man. Our turf to your turf, man. So the Sefer Hamid's woe of Anon, of which two different fragments are now in existence. The copy published by Harkavi. I told you this guy. I want the Harkavi copy of the Sefer Hamid's woe of Anon, ben David. That's the one we want. In 1903, it was published, and the one published by Shexter in 1910. So either one, man, we need these. Have not as yet as yet received any careful study. So they've been holding this one hostage, man. We don't know a lot about this drought, right? We don't know. They 
It hasn't received any careful study, man. Nor have they been compared by, with the body of our own halakha. All the material with the body of our halakha, all the material uh, that we have studied on the subject is of scant nature. If they had scant nature back then, we, we got barely nothing right now, right? This is a serious blow to the one who essays to write on the chariots because the halakha having been the main cause of their contention with the ravenous and exhaustive study of the karya halakha would have amply proved that there was not such a wide diversity between the two as have been commonly supposed if one is to judge solely from the din and clamor evoked by the controversy in both the rabbinic as well as the karyic camps now to say that there's very little on the subject but then earlier say that it was so erroneous well it can't be that erroneous if you don't have that much on the subject <laughs> You know, I mean, people use big words when they just want you to be out of a particular uh, mental capacity and just say, oh, that's erroneous. Don't even think about it. I tend to go right into it when you say that because you're trying to hide something. But there definitely was a schism. And I think what they're trying to hide or cover up is the fact that their oral bullshit, that their oral stuff is bullshit. You know what I mean? They, they want us to believe that everybody was rocking with their oral traditions and their Talmudic stuff. But nah. What can be so serious as to cause these particular uh, branches or, or, or divisions only, you know, if they weren't rocking with something that you're rocking with. <laughs> so uh, from what we can see, unless they can give us another reason to substitute that and you can go dig on some more reasons, you know what I mean? But it seems still very plausible, not erroneous, that the schism happened around the acceptance of this other doctrine of the Tamu, you know what I'm saying, over the Torah. And it's just what they do today. They go all Tamu and very little Torah, and they're just talking the Halakha. And when we go by, put up this link, the Halakha by definition in the Britannica. We're talking Halakha or Halakha, <laughs> all these different spellings. Go to go to go for the dismount, man. Get a little Sefer Hamas well for the dismount. Let's get it. Or the Halakot or Halakot. All right. It's the total laws and ordinances that have evolved since biblical times to regulate religious observances and the daily life and conduct of Jewish people. Now, listen. Well, what's the difference between that and the law of the Torah? What's the schism about? Pay attention. Quite distinct from the law. Right? The law. The law or the Pentateuch, the first. So this, this halakha all right, that they're bringing or the way, right? Halakha purports to preserve and represent what? Oral traditions, right? And that's not all bad because, you know, we know we have our own oral history. I mean, it's nothing wrong with oral history, but the way they connected with the Talmudic, you know, and they put that over the written. Now, you know, there's different perspectives on that. They could say, well, the written can be changed, but so can the oral very easily, right? So that's the, that's the beef. That's the schism. Represents oral traditions stemming from the revelation on Mount Sinai or evolved on the basis of it. The logistical nature of the Halakha all get apart from those parts of rabbinic or Talmudic literature that includes history, fables, ethnic teachings, Haggadah. The Halakha existed from ancient times is confirmed from non pentateuchal passages of the Bible where, for example, servitude is mentioned as a legitimate penalty for unpaid debts. All right. I mean, you can see how people could just add in their own halakha. You know what I mean? Well, you know, you can dig further on the halakha aspect. We're just talking about the rise of the chariots, man. The car, man. And this Kirkasani, one of his most faithful adherents who proclaims that Anand had discovered the entire truth in matters of faith, writes as follows on the subject, the Rosh Yeshiva Ha, referring to Rabbi Ha Ben David, 
who lived in Baghdad and engaged in protracted disputes with the Karyats, and his father, David, translated the Sefer Haman's Woe of Anan from the Aramaic into Hebrew. Hmm. His father, David, translated the Sefer Hamas Woe of Anan. I mean, I guess Preston John would be outliving most of his sons, at least, right? But let's go. Yosef Horeth and his Katib al Astabzar, who also quotes these passages of Kirk Asani, asserts that it was translated from the Aramaic into Arabic, and it's possible. That his reading is the correct. All right. Hold on, hold on, hold on. So David, David translated the Sefer Hamid's Woe well of Anna. And again, this Kirk Hassan keeps popping up because he appears to be an authoritative figure. His surname has been variously derived from ah, my bad, yeah. from Kirkesia, the ancient Circesium. Now that that really sounds like circumcision. Circesium. In Madrid, Kirkesian in Upper Mesopotamia and from Kirka San, the small town in the vicinity of Baghdad. Ah, uh, check it. The sequence of his name implies that he was called Jacob. Wait a minute, man. Come on, man. Sorry for the jumps and this crazy advertisement hijacks, but just follow me now. They're trying to they try to confuse us. Follow me now. He this sequence of his names implies that he was called Jacob, his father Isaac, and his son Joseph. Reproducing the sequence of the biblical patriarchs. Reproducing the sequence. Or are we talking about the same patriarchs popping off way later? Way more recent, my naga. Daniel, Jacob, Joseph, all the dry. Of his non-carried associates, he mentions the rabbinic scholar Jacob Ephraim and the Christian. So I'm just saying, before you blow past like this, you know, this is all some recent stuff, and they're just reproducing stuff. Remember the parallel timelines in history. Remember the parallel timelines in history. Everything you think is happening before 900s is happening after, and this is a very clever way of doing it. The way they go, oh, Rabbi. You know, Levi, you know, Rabbi, you know, Yusuf, Yaqub, you know, they put all these long ass titles just to come on, man. And you start putting it together and you're like, is this, is this all happening? I mean, they were living so long. A lot of these stories overlapped. You know what I'm saying? They were living so long. A lot of these stories overlap. How Kirk Kassani let the logic of his thought and the range of his learning speak for themselves <clears throat> so that he was by far the most formidable champion of carryism of his age man representing the carriots the carriots he trusts me although I am a carrier but it's not fitting that I should command a Tuman in the coming battle between Preston John and Gangs Khan. It mattered, man, that you were a car hit, man. It mattered that you can claim a land by descent to the Katai, the car of Katai. And this Kirk Asani. As it is shown by his two surnames, we're talking Daniel, 
the latter of which is found only in Carcassonne. His attitude to Anon, his violent opposition to the Ananites. So these was this this is the end fighting of these Karyats, man, and a lot of it is centered around their version of their Sefer Ha Meswo. And Daniel wrote several works in Hebrew. <laughs> several, man. There is undeniable evidence that he compiled a legal code, Sefer Hymas Woe. The latter against which Sada, Sadia directs his polemics was perhaps merely a part of the code just mentioned. He also wrote commentaries to the Pentateuch, to Joshua, Judges, and probably other biblical books. We're just talking Daniel, son of Moses. <laughs> or are we just talking Daniel, son of David? Another link that we'll get to next time. Deeper. Digging on it. Now check this out down here. Just belly flopping. Just belly flopping. The movement spread to Iran, Iraq, Palestine, and reached Europe through Constantinople and Andalusia. The sect, which was first called Ananism, right? Ananites, was later called Karaism, and its followers believed that everyone should read and interpret Torah on their own. They said, nah, man, you, you ain't going to give us that hijack. We have the energy to interpret, you know what I'm saying, what our creator has laid out. Now, listen, man, the Hebrew word kara right, means reader in English. So we got before that it means black. And now they're saying the Hebrew word means reader, <laughs> the black reader. The Talmud says that the 10 Jewish men who were religiously competent should come together to read the Torah. So all this in the name Korah. All this around the Sefer Hamas World Book of Commandments. Which has everything to do with the Kumra, Kum, and the Kumasi. The Kumasi. The Kumasi. Everything to do with Kumra. Dead Sea Scrolls. Hmm. This is a nice little preview of a nice little link, another place to dig, man. All these links are really dope. I just surfed the wave today, man. It wasn't planning on it, but it was right here up, man. It was, you see the time, man, five in the morning. Oh, man, I got to get a couple of hours, man. But, you know, I had to get it in because if I didn't do it now, it's going to be days before I can come back to this. So, you know, just get all this, man. You know, get ahead of me. <coughs> Get ahead of me. The language is used by the Karyat Jews over the centuries. Tell us a great deal about the Karyats who employed these languages and can serve as a strong indicator of the nature and the history of the Karyism at each stage of development. A review of the Karyat languages and the significance also proves provides a response to those who think that Karyism has been an unchanging monolith throughout the centuries, rather than a dynamic alternative form of the Jewish religion sharing many of the same developmental characteristics of rabbinic Judaism, but it's not the same. Karyat languages include Babylonian Aramaic used by Proto, Karyat, and uh, Ben David, Hebrew, Benjamin, al Naha, Wendy, Daniel, al Kum, Isi, and other Karyat's Judaic Arabic during the golden age of Karyism in the land of Israel. 
10th and 11th centuries, a Greek infused, Arabicized translation. Hebrew Byzantine carries in the 11th and 12th century. So that Byzantine, again, the Mazaka Empire, the Moses Empire, the Mashika Empire, let's go, rabbinic Hebrew and some other specific. Uh, specifically carry terms all right for carries the issue is not who the founder of carryism because they argue that carryism is the original Judaism right it's the OG the same thing we say is we the OG right they, that's what they that's the same basis for Carius, it is rabbinic Judaism known as the con in the context of Carism as rabbinism, which was an invocation or innovation in the Second Temple period for rabbinites. However, the story of Anand's revolt, motivated by personal pique or pique, <laughs> fits in well with the idea of one normative Judaism form from Mount Sinai to the Messiah, namely rabbinic Judaism. Whatever Anand's role was, text number one is a typical passage from this book of precepts. The passage concerns the use of fire on the Shabbat. Remember that Anand and the Lady Carriers forbade the use of Sabbath lamps, even if lit before the Shabbat. This practice was in full effect until the 15th century. And to this day, Carriers did not prepare food on the Shabbat, Shabbat using ongoing heat. So, you know, they had their specifics, you know what I mean? And. I think it was more than just specific rules, man. It was just really the hijack coming in, <laughs> you know what I mean, from the so-called rabbis, so to speak. Back to these Persian cities, man. And we've been digging on this Persian situation. Again, in etymologies, we just talk paradise. The land of plenty. The land of plenty, my knock. So, you know, you got, you got most of, you know, I can never cover everything I want, but, you know, definitely will be in this link as well. Kirk Asani, the carrier, and his work on Jews. I mean, if you really want to know about Jacob, <laughs> you might want to dig on Kirk Asani. If you want to know about Dan, you might want to dig on the Kumasi. And we'll get more drop out of the rise of the carriers. Because I see... Uh, we just getting started in so many ways. You know, by the time we get to President John 60, we're going to feel like we, we we still just getting started. And how beautiful is that? Because the water continues. Nah, not only made use of the 13 rules of deduction elaborated by Rabbi Ishmael. And again, these are these appear to be the real, you know, players, man. Ishmael is Ishmael. Jacob is Jacob. Eleazar is Eleazar. <laughs> all right, these are all writings and, and what seems to be snapshots or shades of a reality that's really popping off recently, man. Not in no BCs. This is Eliezer. That is just man. That is Jay. That is Dan. This is probably you did. Did indeed undo much of Anand's work, especially his work related to the calendar. It came closer to the time moon, so much closer. Oh, man. The biblical. As to the meanings, so much closer in that, in fact, his Masat Benjamin may properly be considered as a purely rabbinic work containing, as it does, a body of law. So they're saying that this Benjamin was going more towards this rabbinic side. Hmm, okay. There are in entire harmony with our own, with the exception of a few insignificant instances. Insignificant to who? Insignificant to who, man? So, yeah, pull these links up, get this drop, and uh, we'll be picking up in it, man. 
Also, we're going to get back in this one as well. Yeah, man. I mean, I just pulled some drop up, man. I'm just, I'm just skimming through it. But we got to definitely go back in the medieval history of the Israelites to connect a lot of this Khazar situation, man. And um, maybe shine some more light on the carriots as well. La wa. So, you know, we talked about making a dismount. Let's read a couple of uh, positive commandments, man, for the dismount. This is positive commandment 16. We read uh, 15 or, you know, 1 through 15. We did three parts to the Sefer Hamaswell series, and we'll pick it up. Let's get a couple of these, man. This is positive commandment 16. And the 16th mitzvah is that we are commanded to gather the entire nation on the second day of Sukkot during each Shemata year and to read before them certain verses from the book of Deuteronomy, man. So we know we got our Pesach coming up, man. We got Passover flowing and we will pop this year off beautifully. The source of the commandment is Hawa, statement exalted be he. You must gather together the people, the men, women, and children. This is the mitzvah. So that's the source of the commandment. So what they do with it and how they interpret it, you know, and then the oral and all that kind of stuff is what they were trying to dodge. You know what I mean? They were trying to say, all right, let's just, you know, keep it real. You know, let's, let's, let's gather, you know, let's gathering means to gather. You know what I mean, it doesn't, you know, mean this plus this oral plus that oral thing plus that oral thing. And all, now, now you got a bunch of traditions and, a lot of vanity popping off, you know what I mean? In the beginning of the Kadushin, our sages say women are exempt from all positive commandments which are time bound. The Talmud then asks, but Hakel is a time bent positive commandment, and women are obligated. The conclusion at the end of the discussion, one cannot learn from general principles the details of this mitzvah, how one reads, who who reads and what is read are explained in the seventh chapter of the tractate Sota. So that again, that's when it gets specific. Oh, women aren't obligated to do that, or they are obligated to do this. You know what I'm saying? I'm sure Nam and David felt differently than Daniel on a lot of this stuff. You know what I mean? Let's get one more. Positive commandment number 17. And the 17 myths was that we are commanded that every king who sits in rulership, my naga for the dismount, let's go. <laughs> We are commanded that every king or Khan or or Exilar, right, who sits in rulership over the Jewish Hebrew people, right, shall write a Sefer Torah for himself. Sefer Torah. So he's talking about the, the Mishnah Torah, a book of laws, a book of commandments, a book of codes. That it shall never be separate from him. So that's why you got Daniel writing a Sefer Ham as well. Jacob got a separate, you know what I'm saying? Uh, Anon got one. Moses got one. Now, that doesn't mean that some of them aren't the same, you know, uh, duplications of another, you know, that type of thing. It just means that that's why there's so many, you know what I mean? Because each king was commanded to write his own Torah, to write his own book, his own Torah book, all right? That it should never be separate from him. The source of this commandment is a wise statement, exalted be he. And when he is established on his royal throne, he shall write for himself a copy of this Torah. Now you got your book of codes, your book of commandments, set for how woes. All right. And the details of this mitzvah have been explained in the second chapter, ch uh, chapter of Tractate Sanhedrin. Last one here for the dismount, positive commandment, number 18, man. I'm just surfing away with y'all, enjoying the flow, top of the soul. A personal Torah scroll. 18 mitzvahs that every Jewish male should have his own Sefer Torah. It is highly commendable and preferable that he writes it himself. As our sages say, if he himself writes it, it is as if he personally received it at Mount Sinai. Is there some drop in that? If it is possible for him to write it himself, he is at least required to buy one or to appoint someone to write it for him. 
the source of this commandment is a wise statement. Write for yourselves this song. One may not write individual sections of Torah, and therefore not write merely the song of Ha Azinu, which follows this verse. Therefore, the commandment to write the song means the entire Torah, including the song and the tractate Sanhedrin. It is related, Rabbah said, even though a person's forefathers left him a set for Torah, it is still a mitzvah for him to write one for himself, as the verse says, and now write one, write for yourselves this song. All right, so they're interpreting it is as, you know, everyone should write their own, you know, Torah, right? Everyone should write their own Sefer Hamid's well. He must write a Torah scroll for himself and not be satisfied with the one left for him by his forefathers. This implies that the myth of the write a Torah scroll applies only for a king, not for a common person. That's something else they'll argue about, right? The Jamara's answer to this question, the Tosefta's statement does not come to tell you that only the king rather than a common person has this commandment. Rather, it teaches you that the king is obligated to have two Torah scrolls. The proof of this is from the following Barasa. The verse says, he, the king, shall write for himself a copy of this Torah. This means a total of two, two scrolls. All right? The meaning of this statement, the difference between a king and a common person, is that the common person must write for himself one Torah scroll and the king two Torah scrolls. As explained in the second chapter of the tractate Sanhedrin number 7. The laws and conditions governing the writing of the Torah scroll are explained in the third chapter of Tractate Menekos, the first chapter of Tractate Bava Basra, and in Tractate Shabos, man. Shabbat Shalom to the real ones. Y'all keep surfing the wave. See y'all in Press of John, part 52 in our investigation for the priest king. Allow.